Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, RichardDwyer.com, KeepingItFree.Blogspot.com. Let's talk briefly about um, the Stephen Avery case. I've posted some videos up here online, and you know, it's amazing. I'm really intrigued by not the case, but the crowd response, right? I believe that Stephen Avery is obviously guilty. I think it's a stretch to even consider a scenario where law enforcement frames him by dropping a cremated body into his burn pit, right? Uh, and by, of course, planting his blood in a vehicle that they bring back to his property and then taking off the license plates and leaving that someplace else and um, knowing that Stephen Avery has a cut on his hand so that planting the blood evidence is, you know, feasible and expecting that no one's going to uncover this conspiracy. And why have the conspiracy? Because Stephen Avery was an innocent man who was wrongfully imprisoned for an earlier crime. You would think that the police have something better to do with their time than to frame a guy who was wrongfully imprisoned. Well, let me say this. There's been an outpouring uh, in response to my earlier videos where I've posted links uh, to things like the trial transcripts, which might be relevant, right? Stephen Avery's statements to police, which might be relevant. I believe the date of that YouTube video is February 17th, where I actually post links. So, incredibly enough, there's been blowback. Uh, people don't like the idea of Robert Fabian, right? A grown man who wasn't Brendan Dassey, right? Who's not one of the criminally accused, right? Who wasn't uh, misunderstood by police, who in fact showed up to Stephen Avery's trial and testified under penalty of perjury. They don't like the idea of any third-party witness, right, who's not a member of law enforcement, testifying that at 5.20 p.m. on October the 31st, 2005, he was with Stephen Avery and he saw smoke coming out of Stephen Avery's burn barrel, right? I'll agree with the comments that say it's the burn barrel, not the burn pit, right? He saw smoke coming out of Stephen Avery's burn barrel and smelled plastic, right? Burning plastic. Now, of course, we know that Teresa Hallback's camera, her cell phone, and her PDA were all in that burn barrel, right? We know that now. And, of course, they had plastic parts, right? So, I've just pointed out that this third-party witness pretty much kills the prosecution timeline, right? You would have to believe, if there's a frame-up, that the day Teresa Hallback goes missing, right, which coincidentally is the day that she meets with Stephen Avery, right, October the 31st, 2005, that that day, by 5.20 p.m., Police somehow engineered with Stephen Avery home, right? With Brandon Dassey arriving home from school, right? A little bit more than an hour previously. The police somehow found a way to burn plastic items in Stephen Avery's burn barrel so that Robert Fabian could actually observe the burning, right? Could actually have smoke in his face, and smell the plastic. Now, many of you have responded and have a theory that Stephen Avery wasn't the last stop Teresa Hallback had that day. Right? The argument is that she actually left Stephen Avery's place and went to the Zipper residence. Right? That's the argument. And there's folklore about what time she shows up at the Zipporah residence, right? Now, keep in mind, this ignores the 2.27 p.m. call 
between Teresa Hallback and her own office, where Hallback talks about heading to the Avery residence, right? We'll, we'll overlook that inconvenient piece of evidence. Okay, but to all of you who are trying to push this theory that Teresa Hallback actually left Stephen Avery's and then was someplace else later in the afternoon, let me just offer this. <clears throat> and I understand there is a cottage industry of videos up here on YouTube with this zipperer theory. Let me just say this. Can we agree that on the second day of the Avery trial, at page 152, lines 20 to 21, of the court transcript. Mrs. Zipperer herself testifies that Teresa Hallback came to her house between 2 and 2.30. Can we agree to that? If not, then I encourage you to actually go to the trial transcripts. Right? If you want to know about this case, before you look at a documentary, why not look at the trial transcripts where the people involved are actually under oath, are actually testifying under penalty of perjury, right? Why, why is that so unusual? So understand that Mrs. Zipperer testifies that Teresa Hallback is at her place between 2 and 2.30. Now understand, after, you know, some questions before we get to this point, she gives this testimony. Now can we agree that Avery's attorneys, right, Avery's attorneys, the guys who represented him at trial, are excellent attorneys, right? If you believe in the documentary, if you believe in Stephen Avery's case, the arguments he's raising, well, understand it's his attorneys who are raising these arguments. Did you know that after Miss Zipperer testifies that Teresa Hallback was at her place between 2 and 2.30, did you know that Stephen Avery's lawyers had an opportunity to cross-examine her and chose not to? Right? Think about it. They chose not to. That's after questioning her previously. Right? First the prosecution questions her, then they question her, then the prosecution comes back. Right? 2 to 2.30 is what she testifies to. Then Avery's own attorneys say, Your Honor, no further questions. Right? We have nothing further to ask this witness. Now, can we further agree that with regard to Brendan Dassey's trial attorneys, not the attorneys who represented him when he gave the confession, but his trial attorneys, who, of course, had the benefit of the Stephen Avery transcripts, right? Brendan Dassey isn't tried until after Stephen Avery. Right, so they had the benefit of seeing the prosecution's case and of hearing what the witnesses had to say in the earlier trial. Can we agree that in the Dassey trial, after the Avery trial, right, Dassey's attorneys actually stipulated that Teresa Hallback was at the Zipperer residence between 2 and 2.30 that day. Right? Think about it. Right? You have two different sets of lawyers. Avery's lawyers and Assey's lawyers. Right? Avery's lawyers after Mrs. Zipperer, under penalty of perjury, right, says that Teresa Hallback was at her place between 2 and 2.30. <clears throat> Avery's lawyers say no further questions. 
Then you have Dassey's lawyers stipulating to the 2 to 2.30 time frame. Right? Zipperer doesn't even have to testify. Understand, if you're a defense attorney, the reason you stipulate is because you don't want that witness on the stand. Giving testimony that doesn't help your client and having the jury remembering the witness. So understand, the lawyers, the lawyers themselves, had no further questions of Ms. Zipperer after she says that Teresa Hallback was at her place between 2 and 2.30. Right? And, of course, we have a call between Teresa Hallback and her office when she's on the way to the Avery residence. So let me ask you two nation then. Why is there an outcry? Why is there even a theory that Teresa Hallback left the Avery residence and then went to the Zipporah residence. Right? The trial transcripts don't support it. Do they? Right? Understand Dassey's attorneys having the benefit of the Avery transcripts stipulated to the 2 to 2.30 time period. Understand Avery's attorneys, after the testimony, 2 to 2.30, say, Your Honor, no further questions. Right? Aren't we really here making up arguments that aren't supported by the court transcript? In fact, let's go one step further. If you believe, and I'm encouraging you to leave your comments here in the comment section to this video, if you believe that Teresa Hallback left the Avery residence and then went to the Zippera residence, can you please explain to me then how Robert Fabian at 5.20 p.m. was able to smell burning plastic and see smoke coming out of Stephen Avery's burn barrel. Also, how did Teresa Hallback's car then get from the Zippera residence to Stephen Avery's residence? Who's the person who's supposed to have found the car and then brought it back to Stephen Avery's property? Right? Let me also say this too. Some people are trying to claim that members of Stephen Avery's family frame Stephen Avery. In fact, Stephen Avery himself these days is one of those people, right? Which family members would know how to get Stephen Avery's car from the Zipperer residence, not a Stephen Avery's car, but Teresa Hallback's car from the Zipperer residence, or from wherever it is, and then would be able to bring it back <clears throat> to the property and then be able to coordinate with law enforcement <coughs> to get Stephen Avery's blood out of the evidence container from his earlier criminal case. Right? Understand, if you're going to blame the family, then the higher the level of complicating factors, right? The car leaves the property, goes to another place, right? How would anyone in Stephen Avery's family know where Teresa Hallback was heading, right? Understand, the more complicated it gets, the less likely it is that Stephen Avery's family was involved, right? So I encourage people to take a look at the court transcripts. Another thing that fascinates me here is anytime anyone here online talks about the evidence, there's a group of you who will pop out of the weeds and will say, you don't know the facts of the case. 
right? Then you'll launch into some lengthy, you know, theory that seems to deviate from the trial transcripts, from the actual testimony that the jury heard and considered. Right? Now, the best I can do is to just direct people to the actual trial testimony. Right? Let me say this, too. If a witness gives different testimony, right, at other times other than when they're on the stand, why should anyone believe that different testimony more than they believe the testimony the person gives on the stand under penalty of perjury? Right? And so again, it's the second day of the Avery trial. It's the court transcript at page 152, lines 20 to 21. Under oath, Mrs. Zipperer testifies that Teresa Hallback was at her place between 2 and 